The gospel reading for today comes from the book of Mark. And hang on a second, my tablet just quit on me. It did it last Sunday, I don't know if any of you noticed that. Give me one more try here before I go to the paper version. You know, technology's great when it works. Of course, I guess anything's great when it works. Okay, we'll try this one more time. Okay, our gospel reading from the, gospel, from the book of Mark, it describes life as calamity. In the midst of it, Jesus reminds his disciples to make sure they pay attention and don't get distracted by all the bad news. Stay awake and stay alert, he says. Watch for the signs of a new day. So hear this reading from the gospel of Mark. But in those days after that time of distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will lose its brightness, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the promised one coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then the angels will be sent to gather the chosen from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Take the fig tree as a parable. As soon as its twigs grow supple and its leaves come out, you know the summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you know the promised one is near, right at the door. The truth is, before this generation has passed away, all these things will have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But as for that hour, nobody knows it. Neither the angels of heaven nor the only begotten, no one but Abba God. Be constantly on the watch. Stay awake. You do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like people traveling abroad. They leave their home and put the workers in charge, each with a certain task. And those who watch at the front gate are ordered to stay on the alert. So stay alert. You do not know when the owner of the house is coming, whether at dusk, at midnight, when the cock crows, or at early dawn. Do not let the owner come suddenly and catch you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay alert. Well, it's been 21 months since, in the country of Ukraine, the stars started falling from the sky. 21 months since Russia invaded. I think we all thought at the time that it would just be a matter of months before, Russia would, uh, before Ukraine would fall under the sheer uh, weight and power of Russia. But they've hung on in the face of incredible destruction and that still daily threat of death. It's been 57 days since Hamas attacked Israel and mass massacred more than 1,200 people. And the death toll has continued to rise on both sides, especially in Gaza, where reports say over 14,000 people have been killed so far, the majority of which are women and children. What does hope look like when death rains down from the sky? What does hope look like when there is literally no place to go to get away from it. I suspect for a lot of people, hope looks like praying for a miracle, uh, praying for God to just break into our reality and change it for us. In the scriptures, we hear similar types of requests of God, and it comes in the form of a question, how long? How long must we endure? How long will you forget us? How long until you free us? How long, God, until you come again and change this reality? It's a question that I'll bet you just about everybody in this room has probably asked at one time or another. Maybe not because of the imminent threat of death, but simply because life happens. How much, uh, how much longer must I endure a job that's not life-giving? How long must I be sick? How long will this grief last? How long will we continue to be angry with each other? How long must I endure abuse? It's like, how long? Like our ancestors in faith, maybe you too have prayed for that miracle, for God to step into your reality and just change it overnight. It's a question that arises when things seem out of control when life is too much and when we just don't see any ways out. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he's my favorite theologian, he's a German theologian in uh, Nazi Germany. He was executed for participating in a plot to assassinate Hitler. Uh, he was arrested and executed just before the Allies came to the prison camp where he was. But he wrote a letter from that prison and he says, a prison cell like this is a good analogy for Advent. One waits, one hopes, one does this or that, ultimately negligible things, but the door is locked and can only be opened from the outside. And so we pray for a miracle. We pray for God to open that door from the outside so we can escape whatever our current reality is. Now, as much as I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I've never liked that quote. <laughs> because, like the question, how long, it seems to put us in the place of waiting for someone else to act. Someone else to open, unlock that door and open it from the other side. We, we wait with hope that God will indeed do that. But nevertheless, we wait, powerless to open the door from our side with that question of how long just lingering on our lips. I think we're actually asking the wrong question. Because when we ask how long, it implies, number one, that we have no power. It implies the power all resides with somebody else. But it also means we are asking a very future-oriented question, how much longer into the future do we have to wait? We're asking a future-oriented question of a God who lives in the present. In the Gospel reading, Jesus uses apocalyptic language to, come, to talk about the coming of God's reign. It's a time of distress and darkness. The stars are falling from the sky. Basically, all creation is returning to its original chaos. Things are so bad. Surely, it's now bad enough that God is about ready to come wipe out all that's evil, all that's life-diminishing, and finally establish God's beautiful, peaceful, life-giving kingdom here on earth. And Jesus talks about it in terms of be ready when you see these things. It means God is coming. But the words Jesus uses don't match other things he said in the scriptures. Uh, those of you who've listened to me long enough know that when I read Scripture, I pay attention to what fits and what doesn't. And these words don't fit Jesus by saying, just wait. Watch, but wait, God is coming. Because everywhere else Jesus talks about God is already here. I think he's talking about the incredible um, pressure that people were facing at that time to live their faith in a world where it was you literally took your life in your hands to do that. He was talking to people who for centuries had been lived, have been living under oppression of foreign occupiers, where they have not been free to practice their faith. In fact, where their faith has been desecrated by these occupying powers. And they have longed for that day when God would end that. And we see some of that in these words that Jesus has just said. But when you really put it in context of everything else Jesus says, we realize that Jesus is not telling us God's not here yet, but God's coming. God's telling, uh, Jesus is telling us that God is here. God is near. When we are waiting for God to open that door from the other side, what we're missing is the fact that God is in that cell with us. You find in the scriptures numerous cases where um, <laughs> we're going to the paper version here. Hang on. Um, we'll see how well I know my sermon as I just continue to talk while I find my place. Um, but we find numerous times in the scriptures Jesus talking about the kingdom of God is near. And do you remember when he does that? It's when someone has been healed. When Jesus has been healed, has healed someone, he says, the kingdom of God has come near. And when he casts out demons, he says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Jesus' whole message is that we don't have to wait for God to come. God is already here. 
God is already present with us. And so when we are afraid of the future, when we are wondering when things are going to end and so all will be better, we have to remember we are not in this alone. We find that it is in the chaos and grief and depression and hurt and the fear that God is already most powerfully present. God is not standing back waiting for some magical moment to unlock a door. God meets you right where you are, in the midst of your chaos, in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of your grief, your anger, your lostness. Wherever you are and whatever you are dealing with, God is already there with you. As Psalm 139 says, there is nowhere we can go where God is not already present. So Jesus saying, stay awake and stay alert, I think has more to do with looking for signs of where God already is than hoping God will come. How would it change the way you frame your life if you lived it thinking God was already here versus waiting for God to come? If you knew God was already at work in whatever chaos you are living in, How would that change the way you live your daily life? Versus Bonhoeffer sitting in that prison cell saying, we wait in hopes of someone opening the door from the other side. Amy Oden, in her book, Right Here, Right Now, it's the church, it's a a book that we're using for our church book study right now. She uses the term mindfulness to talk about staying alert to God's presence. She's not talking about looking for evidence of miracles where, you know, the the laws of nature are suspended so that something extraordinary can happen. She's saying, look for signs of the kingdom already among us. If Jesus is powerfully present, or as Jesus said, if the kingdom is powerfully present where wounds are healed, where forgiveness is offered, where do you see healing happen? Where do you see forgiveness being offered? The kingdom of God is right there. In whom do you see grace that lifts others up when others are trying to tear people down? The kingdom of God. God is present right there. Where do you see someone watering a flower in a place where a flower has no business growing? The kingdom of God is already present in that moment. Where do you experience hope and mercy and love and forgiveness and generosity and grace? You are experiencing God's presence and the kingdom of God. Wherever you see those things and wherever you experience those things, God is here. But the question is, is do we notice that? Do we pay attention to that? Or are we so caught up in our own chaotic lives that we miss it? And so we miss signs of God's hope being with us. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own needs and the things that we lack that we forget we worship this God who is already here. And so we can still feel trapped. We can still feel lost. We can still feel hopeless, but it's because we forget. We forget to look, but when we stop, we take that deep breath, we step back for a moment from whatever chaos we have and look for the beauty around us. We look for signs of where God is at work. We find God, even in the midst of the most terrible wars. The more we intentionally take that time to pause and look, the more aware we become of just how present God really is in this world. And the hope that we talk about, I don't know about you, but when I use the word hope, I'm usually thinking of, well, I hope this thing happens, but I really don't know for sure. Every once in a while I get curious and I look words up in the dictionary, that's actually not what hope means. Hope means you have the confidence that it will happen. 
It's not wishful thinking. You know this is going to happen. And that's what hope is. So when we start looking for those signs of God's presence and we notice it more and more, then we don't have that wishful thinking kind of hope. We have that confidence kind of hope that says, I don't care how bad it is. God is right here with me. And God is at work bringing life out of death. God is at work changing lives. That's one reason I wanted Carrie to share that story about the prayer shawl. I can guarantee you that woman felt God's presence and so did Carrie. It seems such a small thing, handing out a piece of knitted cloth to someone who's just asking for it. But in the sharing of those prayers and that love, the kingdom of God was present in very powerful ways. Experiences like that remind us that the kingdom really is already here. And it frees us from fear. It frees us from being captive to the chaos that is around us. And as we continue to look for those signs of God's presence in the kingdom, we can share those glimpses with others and help build up that hope for other people as well. We just need to remember, we worship a God who brings life out of death, even in the midst of stars raining out of the sky. That's what Christmas is about. God putting on flesh and blood and entering our reality. Or as Eugene Peter Uh, Peterson said in his translation of the Gospel of John, he says, God moved into our neighborhood. Did not take us out of our neighborhood and put us somewhere else. God moved into our neighborhood. God is with us. So when you start to understand God's presence that way, the question, how long, doesn't make as much sense, does it? How long until God comes to set us free? God has already set us free. It just may look different than what we were originally hoping for. God has already unlocked doors. God has already cast off chains. The better question is, is when are we going to step out of our prison cells as free people and share that good news with others? When are we going to live lives that are no longer held captive to fear or hatred? Or will we stay in ourselves and miss out on what God is doing? It has been 2,000 years since Jesus walked this earth as one of us. If God hasn't wiped the earth clean of all that is evil and all that diminishes life and remade it into God's perfect kingdom by now, I don't think that's what God intends. Rather, God is with us in the midst of this life in sometimes very small ways, a prayer shawl, a visit, a word of encouragement, sometimes in big ways, through people coming together with that confident hope that God is at work and we could be a part of it. God is here. Pay attention. Pay attention to when God shows up. Notice the way God's love and grace is at work in someone else's life and in yours. Notice how God gives you what you need, which may not necessarily be what you're asking for. But pay attention to that. And then maybe instead of asking that question, how long? You just might end up saying thank you. Amen.